The Hunt brothers were not the last billionaire to make a move on silver. Warren Buffett bought 130 million ounces, or roughly one-fifth of the world's inventory at the time, in 1997. He held that position all the way until 2006. My question is, why is the richest man in the world, who is known for buy and hold, and finding permanent value, be scared out of his position? The only comment I ever found disclosing what happened to this trade was Warren Buffett saying, I bought it very early, I sold it very early, other than that, it was perfect. Now, I have no proof of this. But I am willing to speculate that at the exact same time that Warren Buffett was forced out of his silver position, he was heavily involved with the AIG scandal with Hank Greenberg. Warren Buffett's General Re took the other side of a lot of shady AIG positions. The deals ended Hank Greenberg in 2005, and yet Warren Buffett escaped with only a $50 million slap on the wrist. Is it out of the realm of possibility to say that Warren Buffett was feeling the heat and offered the elitist insiders his stash of silver to get out of the kitchen? The timing and situation is way too coincidental. And all of this was before AIG stole $186 billion in the biggest bankster bailout ever. Sure, Tim Geithner was the president of the New York Federal Reserve Bank in the fall of 2008 when the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and the White House and the Congress decided to bail out AIG. Right. In the process of that bailing out of AIG, many, many documents were exchanged. If you went to the bank to borrow money, you would have to fill out documents. One of the documents AIG filled out said, we owe X dollars to Goldman Sachs and we plan on paying them 100 cents on the dollar. According to Bloomberg, Emails that came out yesterday say that lawyers for the Federal Reserve Bank said we were told to strike this from the form so that AIG would not reveal to the Treasury Department or to the public that this money was going to be paid to Goldman Sachs because that's a politically toxic issue. Goldman Sachs making a fortune, making a hundred cents on the dollar with federal funds. Now. If you go to buy a $25 savings bond from the federal government and you falsify the document to acquire that bond, you can go to jail. That's right. If you borrow $185 billion from the government, like AIG did, and you falsify a document, even if the government told you to do so, the people involved can go to jail. According to Bloomberg, one of the people who told them to do so was the now Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner. And coincidentally, at the exact same time that Warren Buffett supposedly sold his silver, Barclays started the SLV ETF with, guess what, 130 million ounces. I have to admit, I was quite excited when SLV came onto the market in 2006. I love the idea of buying physical silver with the ease of buying a stock. However, it did not take long for rumors to come out that there was not enough physical silver backing the shares and that JP Morgan and HSBC, the largest shorts in the silver market, were also the custodians of that SLV. I then saw SLV as a paper scam to siphon off investment demand out of the physical metal and into another paper Ponzi scheme. SLV in a few short years has increased its reserves to 16 times the original inventory at its inception. I have seen weeks when SLV added 523 tons in one week to its inventory and the price of silver didn't move at all. That confirmed my suspicions. Since I have entered politics, I have chiefly had men's views confided to me privately. Some of the biggest men in the United States in the field of commerce and manufacture are afraid of somebody or afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. President Woodrow Wilson, the president that signed into existence the Federal Reserve. There are more powerful people out there than even Warren Buffett. They are the men that own the world's central banks, and in turn, the world's governments, militaries, corporations, natural resources, and ultimately humanity. Give me the control of the credit of a nation, and I care not who makes the laws. Nathaniel Rothschild Warren Buffett is now no more than a puppet of those that own and control the paradigm, namely the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers. In 2002, Warren Buffett and Arnold Schwarzenegger traveled to England to meet Jacob Rothschild one year before Arnold became the governor of California. As a paradigm puppet, Warren is allowed to keep his wealth so long as he serves to keep the paradigm intact. Time and time again, he has come to the paradigm's rescue. He spoke words of confidence in 2008. He even bought part of Goldman Sachs. He perpetually toes the line on CNBC with Becky Quick about the value of Americans investing in stocks. He supports Barack Obama and the false left-right paradigm. 
He is a proponent of Obamacare. He says the wealthy are not paying enough, and yet does not offer to pay more, or better yet, expose the system that is rigged to keep us down and profit those that are in control. He is for collectivist ideas like a heavy progressive income tax, the abolition of all rights of inheritance, and the centralization of credit of the state. These are just three of the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. If you're wondering why supposed capitalists are for these things, is because it is a concentration of power to the wealthy at the very top. He speaks against derivatives, and then invests in them. He complains about our trade deficit, and then invests heavily in China. And now he has become a boisterous opponent of gold. If you offered me the choice of looking at some 67-foot uh, cube of gold and looking at it all day, you know, and maybe touching it and fond fondling it occasionally, you know, and then saying, you know, do something for me, and it says, I don't do anything, I just stand here and look pretty. And, and, <laughs> and the alternative to that was to have all the farmland in the country, everything, cotton, corn, soybeans, seven Exxon Mobiles, just think of that, add a trillion dollars of walking around money, I, I, you know, maybe call me crazy. But Not only am I going to call Warren crazy, I'm going to call him irrelevant and a hack. All of those things Warren owns, or says he would rather own than gold, only have value so long as the paper paradigm that he whores for functions. What good is all that farmland, seven Exxon Mobiles, and a trillion dollars of Federal Reserve notes if we live in a world where Warren's bosses can create $16 trillion out of thin air, or simply regulate, tax, and even nationalize the companies and land? What good are any of those income-producing assets when we have the mathematically inevitable collapse of the world's first debt-based global reserve currency? What good are those income-producing assets when there is no economy because there is no currency? What good are those income-producing assets in a world full of war, riots, and death? Farmland and oil companies are income-producing asset, and gold is money, wealth protection, and insurance. They serve two completely different purposes in the investment world and act counter to each other when times are greedy or fearful. Warren Buffett could easily educate people on the two different purposes of these financial assets. Every 20 years or so, we go through shifts in perceived wealth. In the 40s and 50s, optimism propelled paper assets like blue chip stocks. In the 60s and 70s, fear caused tangible assets like oil, cattle, gold, and silver to outperform. In the 80s and 90s, paper assets like stocks were once again the place to be. Since 2000, tangible assets have been soaring while paper assets flounder. Unfortunately for Warren Buffett and the rest of the population addicted to paper assets, we still have another decade to go. And at the end, this will coincide with the mathematically inevitable collapse of the dollar, the demise of the U.S. as a global superpower, the fading age of the baby boomers, and most likely another world war. How will those paper assets handle that when there's no more high-frequency trading, banker bailouts, media propaganda, and the overall revulsion of those in power that either did nothing to prevent the collapse or at worst gutted the country so they could tack on another billion to the bottom line. Warren Buffett is irrelevant. What made Warren Buffett a great investor in the past was his ability to see value in stocks and ride the secular bull market that pushed his wealth to untold heights. But now he has so much invested in that paradigm he can't get out of it, so he's forced to defend it. Warren Buffett is irrelevant because that pretty brick of gold that does nothing has smoked this financial genius over the past decade, and yet he still has the gall to attack it. Since 2001, the average CNBC viewer is at best break-even if they invested in the Dow in nominal terms. This does not include for inflation and taxation. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway has returned a little more than 50% over a decade, and again, that does not include inflation or taxation. Meanwhile, that brick of gold that does nothing has returned 1,300% just sitting there. Perhaps people should be paying a million dollars to have lunch with a hunk of gold instead of this has been. Understanding where the market is going and getting there ahead of everyone else is the key of creating generational wealth. For example, if you got out of stocks in 2000 and bought a house, and then sold that house at the top of the housing bubble in 2005, and then plowed those profits directly into silver, you would have been up 3,500% over the past 12 years, and all of it tax-free and inflation protected. That's it. Two simple trades done over 12 years has been all the difference. While this is an accomplishment I'm proud of, it is nothing compared to the real returns that we're going to see when this paradigm ends. With the mathematically inevitable collapse of the dollar, all paper assets will be rendered worthless as people learn the true meaning of counterparty risk. Only things that have real tangible value will have the means of protecting wealth, and nothing shines brighter than silver. In fact, it took 17,000 ounces of silver to buy one share of Berkshire Hathaway in 2001. 
Now it is 3,200 ounces. That is a dramatic loss in real purchasing power if you held your wealth in Berkshire Hathaway. And silver has not even started to get moving yet. And despite gold outperforming Warren Buffett over this past decade, he still comes out and says, It gets dug out of Africa or someplace. We melt it down, we dig a hole, we bury it again, and we pay people to stand around guarding it. It has no utility. Anyone watching it from Mars would be scratching their head. Warren Buffett is a hack. He could be telling the truth about how the world works and use his fame to help millions to avoid the single largest event in human history. He could explain to the masses what role gold plays in economics and liberty. But no, he sings songs lulling people back into complacency while the masses are led into a generational slaughterhouse. He should be warning the world of what is coming and the dramatic impact of the mathematically inevitable collapse of the dollar will have on humanity. He could help millions into financial lifeboats like tangible assets with his fame. But no, he continues to pay lip service to a paradigm that only benefits those at the top, while the rest of the world continues to struggle with inflation, crony capitalism, banker bailouts, never-ending war, massive malinvestment, and outright fraud. When we see the final collapse of this paradigm, history will come down very hard on those that should have known better or participated in the collapse. Now you may think that I'm being hard on the old man, but I know he knows better. How do I know this? Look at the writings of his father, Congressman Howard Buffett. I will not take time to review the history of paper money experiments. So far as I can discover, paper money systems have always wound up with collapse and economic chaos. One of the first moves by Lenin, Mussolini, and Hitler was to outlaw individual ownership of gold. You begin to sense that there may be some connection between money, redeemable, and gold, and a rare prize known as human liberty. I warn you that politicians of both parties will oppose the restoration of gold, although they may outwardly seemingly favor it, unless you are willing to surrender your children, your country, to galloping inflation, war, and slavery, then this cause demands your support. For if human liberty is to survive in America, we must win the battle to restore honest money. There is no more important challenge facing us than that issue, the restoration of your freedom to secure gold in exchange for the fruits of your labor. In the end, Warren Buffett is a high-paid hack. He is simply bought and paid for like all the other major players in economics, politics, media, academia, military, and medicine. They are all either actively or passively supporting a paradigm and selling the illusion that gives them incredible power. Rare is the man who is given the keys to the kingdom and walks away. Apparently, even the brightest minds entrenched in the liberty movement can be corrupted. In absence of the gold standard, there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. There is no safe store of value. For if there were, the government would have to make its holding illegal, as it is done in the case of gold. If everyone decided, for example, to convert their entire bank deposits to silver or copper or any other good, and thereafter decline to accept checks as payment for goods, bank deposits would lose their purchasing power, and the government-created bank credit would be worthless as a claim on those goods. The financial policy of the welfare state requires that there be no way for owners of wealth to protect themselves. This is the shabby secret of the welfare status tirades against gold. Deficit spending is simply a scheme of confiscation of wealth. Gold stands in the way of this insidious process. It stands as a protector of property rights. If one grasps this, one has no difficulty in understanding the status antagonism towards gold. That was written by none other than the most powerful central banker of our time, Alan Greenspan. You see, Alan Greenspan mentored under the libertarian guru Ayn Rand, who wrote classic novels like Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. And yet, as time went on, he sold his convictions short so that he could gain more and more power and further enslave humanity with debt. Men like Alan Greenspan and Warren Buffett could do so much to bring economic sanity and human freedom to the world. They are old and really have nothing left to lose. Their words would cut like a knife through the paradigm that spreads debt and death throughout the world. But they continue to perpetuate the lie and smile at us while they do it. I am left to ask the question, who is worse, the criminals or the men that enable the criminals? History will decide.